Welcome to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman, the podcast dedicated to helping you build the business of your dreams and live the life you always hoped for, with valuable and fun tips and info to make your life easier and more fun. And now, here's your host, a man who sprinkles metal shavings on his breakfast cereal just for fun, Jason Silverman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. I'm your host, Jason Silverman. I'm thrilled to share some time with you once again today. As you know, I'm always in the hunt for interesting as well as super smart Real Deal guests, and i got to tell you, today's show knocks it out of the park. I want my listeners to get introduced to somebody who's truly been there and done that, and I'm excited to pick her brain both for your benefit as well as my own. Now, for the folks who I work with in any of my coaching programs or through Powerful Words Character Development or All-Star Cheer Sites or even the Jason's Army Mastermind Group, you know how much I focus on the importance of client first impressions, right? Well, this show is going to help us to address that. So today's going to be my honor and privilege to share an amazing resource with you. You're going to love today's guest. She's got a ton of valuable information about something I consider to be one of those keystones between success and mediocrity. So strap yourself in. Today's show is going to be a blast. As I'm sure you already know, I'm committed to helping business owners just like you to become more successful, enjoy your career more, and in general, make your life significantly more fun. Let's face it, folks. We only get one ride on this merry-go-round. Let's make sure it's one hell of a ride, shall we? Alrighty, boys and girls, it is now that time. I want you to stop surfing Facebook, put away your phone, your tablet, your dog, your cat, your spouse, your child, anything that might possibly distract you from today's show. You're about to get some great and immediately implementable information, and I don't want you to miss even a second of it. So, before we officially get going, let me give you a little bit of background about our special guest expert today. Carmen Simon is a cognitive neuroscientist and founder of Rexy Media, a company that uses brain science to help corporations create memorable messages. She's also a best-selling author and leading expert on using memory to influence decision-making. Her most recent book, Impossible to Ignore, Create Memorable Content to Influence Decisions, has won the acclaim of publications such as Inc.com, Forbes, and Fast Company. It has been selected as one of the top 10 books of the year. Carmen speaks frequently to corporate, academic, and government audiences on neuroscience research findings related to creating memorable messages based on how the brain works. She holds doctorates in both instructional technology and cognitive psychology. Carmen, welcome to The Real Deal. I'm thrilled to have you today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for inviting me, and welcome, everyone. Oh, this is going to be fabulous. So before we officially get started, for the folks who haven't had the opportunity and pleasure of meeting you or hearing you speak or reading your book yet, do me a favor and take a second. Share your story with our listeners. You know, what are you passionate about? What makes you tick? Who is Carmen Simon? I get uh, very intrigued by what the brain remembers and um, even equally importantly, what the brain forgets. So the center of my research is this concept of not so much improving your own memory, but rather influencing other people's memory. And um, I put a lot of energy into that simply because I'm convinced that where business is concerned, the only way to stay successful in business, and I know it's a very strong statement saying the only way, but it really is thinking about it. The only way to stay successful in business is to stay on people's minds, simply because people will decide to come to your after-school activities, will decide to come and join your karate class or your dancing show based on what they remember, not on what they forget. That's brilliant on so many levels. I love this. Oh. Folks, we're, uh, we're in for a treat. All right, I want to dig in. So tell me this. Why, why do you believe memory is important in business? Memory is the um, important ingredient to business simply because the brain only makes decisions based on what it remembers. Think about it this way. Let's just consider a decision that you've made uh, recently. So tell me, tell me something that you've decided to do lately. It can be small or large. It doesn't matter. What's a decision you've made recently? I made a decision to uh, get myself to one of these crazy functional fitness gyms every day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And what do you think prompted that decision? Prompted the decision that I, I didn't feel as great as I thought I could. I felt like I was missing out. 
Yeah, exactly. So perhaps you were trying to uh, chase after a, a kid on the street and you're thinking, shoot, I, sh- I should have more energy right now. Or perhaps you're trying to make it a flight of stairs and you're really realizing that you're, uh, you're out of breath and uh, that stays in your mind a little longer. Then you see, ultimately, whether you know it or not, consciously, your decision will have been backed up by some memory that resides in your brain long term. So that's why I'm um, prompting everyone who's listening to this to consider this. How strongly are they on people's minds when they try to approach them with a message, with an email, with a reminder? Because to the extent that you stay on people's minds is the extent that you will continue to have customers. Wow, that's brilliant. The extent to which you stay in their minds is the extent to which you'll have customers. I love that. And what's the, why should we be in business? Because I mean, the only reason why you want to stay in business is because you want to have some customers. <laughs> Well, you, you know, many of the folks who uh, who either own or they coach at at gyms or schools or studios, you know, they they're drawn to it. It's almost like a calling. They want the opportunity to change these kids' lives. But I guess if you have nobody to teach or coach, you're not exactly. changing any lives. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What What are some of the reasons why our audiences forget so much of what we share with them? There are quite a few variables that impact forgetting, and I'm glad that you're mentioning forgetting because remembering and forgetting are part of the same coin. In order for you to focus on something and be more likely to remember it, you're most likely do it, doing it at the expense of something else. So when that something else is gone, what the reason, what's the reason why it's, why it's gone? I'm sure you can relate to many of these variables I'm about to share. One of the reasons we forget is because we don't pay attention to begin with. Imagine when you're first meeting someone. I'm sure that everyone listening to this has troubles with remembering names and faces. And one of the reasons we we don't remember is because we don't pay attention. So if somebody says, hey, my name is Jason, and uh, they shake your hands, it's very likely that in that moment they may have been somewhere else and, uh, and not really focused. So one of the ways to remember that is to repeat the person's name, to be present, and to use it a few times to the conversation. There are some other mnemonic devices that experts will, uh, will share, but not paying attention is one of the variables. Another variable is um, interference, which means that we hear so many messages that at some point they will interfere with each other and we will not know who said what. And for many of you listening and thinking, I have to promote my uh, next gym program or a dancing program or a karate program, whatever it is, investigate your own message and now consider how many other people who have a similar business as yours are saying the same thing. Because there are several things where memory is concerned. One is the content itself that we remember, and the other one is the source. And what I'm noticing where business is concerned is quite often we have good messages to share. But because many other people are saying the same thing, people will not remember the source. So essentially, you put a lot of effort into advertising somebody else or delivering somebody else's message. Mm. Well, I, I know that for a fact, um, I remember I ran a martial arts school for a whole lot of years. And every time my competitors would send out a flyer or they'd send out a postcard, I would get new members. Because, again, they were flooding that, that, that information out there. And I, I think most of them did a, a cruddy job of, you know, cutting through that noise. Again, I had an awful lot more noise than they did. So mm-hmm. Exactly. So the more competition you have in your field, the harder you have to work at finding some distinctive factor. And here's the good news. Sometimes people think, oh, if I have to distinguish myself, therefore I have to work really, really hard. And you don't because when you look at science and you want to debunk some myths that exist out there around attention, memory, decision-making, One of them is that the brain doesn't need a whole lot of novelty. It still does need some in order to pay attention and to focus and therefore to remember. But if we provide the brain with too much novelty, we're jarring it too much and we're asking it to expand too much cognitive energy. So a good combination between what the brain finds familiar and what it finds new is uh, is the way to go. So the practical way to look at this is to think, What is a message that everybody understands easily? And to that, can I twist things just a tiny little bit? And I'll give you an example. There is a bookstore uh, somewhere in Israel, and uh, they had an advertisement. Obviously, as a bookstore, what do you want to have? You want to have customers, like we were saying. And we want people to come in and and buy a book. And because they know where people's habits are, and most of us uh, relate to, uh, to Facebook, for instance, their ad simply showed on a blue banner the word face 
a book. So you see, they only inserted the uh, the letter A within a word and within a structure that we already find familiar and habitual. So my advice to everyone listening to this is to consider your message, stay with the familiarity which the brain enjoys, and twist it ever so slightly, and that's where you have the optimal combination of familiarity plus surprise. Fabulous. Fabulous, fabulous. I mean, obviously that takes a bit of creativity, but not it's, it's not rocket science. Exactly. And not the whole lot. Like that creativity doesn't have to come from the standpoint of, oh, I have to change everything, therefore be distinguished. I just have to change things just ever so slightly. So the metaphor that I sometimes use when I coach uh, business speakers is to think of applying the element of surprise and novelty as caviar, not marmalade. Because if, think about it this way. If you're, if you're drinking coffee and you love a little bit of sugar, a teaspoon might be good. Two you're pushing it. Now, three tablespoons of sugar in your coffee are just way too much. It's the same for, for the brain. If, um, if, I, if you and I, Jason, had a few million dollars and we could put all of our listeners' brains in uh, fMRI machines right now and we would give them some um, sets of pictures to watch so fast that the conscious brain would not be able to register them, and then outside of the scanner, we would show them the same set from within the scanner and also a new set, and we would ask them, which set of pictures do you prefer? Their brains would go towards the familiar pictures simply because when we have familiarity, we can predict what happens next. That's what the familiarity gives you because the brain has been designed not to miss anything and we're constantly on a fast forward, which is why meditation, for instance, is so difficult for some. Being present is not easy for the brain. We just all want to anticipate because a brain that anticipates is a brain that, that uh, survives. So in that anticipation, familiar, familiarity helps us out a lot. So stay with what the brain considers familiar and twist things ever so slightly. Ooh, this is fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I want, I want to switch gears for just a second, if I can. You know, you talked about the source. <clears throat> so I'm guessing the source being the business or the business owner who's, mm -hmm. um, who's, who's spouting the noise. So do you have some suggestions when, you know, as far as how owners can make themselves more memorable? Yeah, I'm glad you're asking this because we're talking about, um, from your audience's perspective, the memory for the content versus the memory for source. In fact, there is this whole field where memory search is, uh, research is in, concerned, which is called exactly that source memory. So as a, as a person you have, or as a business entity, you have a responsibility now to make sure that whatever messages you're transmitting to others, do they remember the contents and you, and is that important? Because at some point, if you're simply serving a function, maybe you as a source are not important. But if you have competition, then the source is just as important as, uh, as your content. So here's some practical thing to consider. If I were an owner of a small business and I want to attract more customers, instead of hitting their brains with the content first, hit them with the familiarity of the source first. So perhaps if you have a small event where you're asking people to just simply come and meet with you before you try to sell them anything, host a small um, uh, meetup or an event where you're just simply introducing yourself and your passion for your field and what you plan to do without pitching. That's how you're creating first the memory for the source. Otherwise, this is what happens. If you as a source deliver some messaging and you have a business proposition for your customers and your competition has a very similar one and there, there are more people in your field yet, after a while, your audience's brains are not going to be able to distinguish who said what. And the, the worst part is that they will give credit to the most familiar source. Mm. So in other words, if you, have, you may remember years back, um, uh, the Olympics uh, did a survey after the Olympics were over saying, hey, do you know who sponsored the Olympics? And Coca-Cola was the sponsor, and 5% of the respondents said Pepsi was the sponsor. And even though that's a small percentage where you talk about large numbers, 5% is indeed impactful. So how would you feel if you had a good message for your audiences and somebody else thought somebody else said it? Oh, God, it would drive me nuts. Yeah, yeah. So um, get people to be familiar with you first and then your content, if you're not that well-known in your community just yet. Do you feel like, I mean, just speaking technically for a sec, do you, do you feel like um, using a tool like um, either live video on Facebook 
getting yourself out there so people are used to seeing your face, used to hearing your voice, is that one of those tools that would actually bring you through? I'm so glad that you're mentioning this because then let's zoom in a little bit more and determine, well, how do you get the source to be known? And if you believe that it's the face that you're showing, let's just say through a tool that you recommended, is also the face that they will see at decision time, then that's definitely a good way to go. And I'm cautioning you, though, about this because here's something to consider. Whenever we want to attract our customers and we have a message for them, that happens at point A. And then later on, we hope that they make a decision in our favor at point B. And point B might be a day after they saw that message, a week, a month, depending on your business and when you want people to decide to come and join you in some way or buy from you or believe in your idea or your, your product. So point A, from what point A to point B, some time elapses. That's the point I'm making. And a practical thing to take away from this is at point A, ensure that you're showing something that will also appear in people's lives at point B. So if you're saying I'm promoting my face and it's a video of me, if I'm also going to be seen at point B and I'm going to interfere with that decision, then that's a good way to go. However, if I'm showing my face at point A, but at point B people will see someone else or only see some flyers or will see something that has nothing to do with me, then uh, that's not the best way because the more things match between point A and point B, the stronger the memory and therefore the stronger the decision, simply because lack of consistency is often equated with lack of credibility. So if we see things in one way one time, but then another way another time, then we become skeptical. Ah, I love that. Lack so consider who is the source that's more that needs to be familiar and will show up in people people's lives later on. Got it. So it could be that who, who's actually ever doing the closing has got to be a part yes. of that video so that... Yes, exactly, exactly. So let's just say that maybe you're the business owner, but it's some of your instructors who are going to be the convincing factor later on and make sure that you include them in that uh, initial familiarity video. I love that. It might be some of your staff. It might be even some of the flyers that you may show later on. So the more you suddenly start introducing a few things at point A and stay consistent with those throughout your journey, then the stronger your tactic is simply because the brain equates consistency with validity. Consistency with validity. <clears throat> That's brilliant. So as far as challenges are concerned, um, what do you find to be the biggest challenges in you know, being and staying memorable? Well, let's continue on that same um, train of thought for a second because consistency from point A to point B is such a crucial thing, and I'm noticing that as a flaw that we have in business content all the time. And why is it that we have to be cautious by it? Because memory, here's a, a, a myth that we debunk with science. Memory has not, we don't have memory because we want to remember the past. We have memory because we need to remember the future. And this is a strong statement, so I'll come back to this. Retrospective memory means simply remembering what happened in the past. So for you joining that uh, fitness program, for instance, is something that took place recently. But the only reason why you need to remember a few of those things is because you want to make decisions in the future. So prospective memory, which is remembering to act on a future intention, is where business owners are mostly most best serves to, uh, to spend their energy on. So let's talk a little bit about prospective memory, which hardly ever do we hear about where business content is concerned. So that means... Whatever you do in terms of attracting customers or how you want to interact with them, communicate with them, constantly wonder, am I saying something right now at point A that's likely to stay on their long-term memory at point B in the future where they can act on it? Hmm. And one of the ways to get there is through the use of cues. Uh, here's another strong statement that I'll, I'll share with any business owner. You will only be as memorable as your cues. And what do I mean by this? Let's just say that um, I wanted to somehow motivate you to eat in a healthier kind of way. Who wouldn't want that, right? <laughs> so here's a, here's a study that uh, that was done where let's just say that you are all on a campus 
and um, I would have some flyers and I would post those flyers and maybe those flyers have this beautiful image of an apple and it's red and it's lush and maybe a bite has already been taken out of it. And maybe I use some text around that uh, apple that says eating healthy will uh, add three years to your life. I'm just making up this, this text. But imagine there's a combination of an inviting picture and some text. And I believe that if I post these flyers in just the right way, people will remember this. And as a result, when they enter their cafeteria, they will uh, remember that apple and the text. And what would they do in those three years of added uh, longevity? And they will act on those intentions and they will reach for the apple and not the chocolates. But that's just wishful thinking because the brain doesn't operate that way. Simply showing it a poster with a nice image and some catchy text doesn't do the trick, especially when we're so overly abused these days with so many, many messages anyway. So better, a better way is to think of cues. What would be something that shows up in people's context at point B that will cue their memory, that will trigger their memory to act on a good intention? So a better strategy is if I know that at point B, what is it that people use in order to put food on their place? They use a tray. So instead of simply posting those flyers on poles or around the cafeteria, imagine that I would put that flyer on the bottom of the tray. So that as I have that tray in my hands and I'm, I'm faced with a few choices, now I can reach for the apple and not the, uh, the chocolate because that reminder is already there. I don't have to tax my brain so much that I have to, uh, to bring to mind a specific memory. So at point A then, I may show the flyer that already has the cafeteria tray with the apple on it so that at point B, they see the exact same cue and that matches with point A. Huh. So you're basically always playing that, your, your brain's always playing that memory game like we play with our kids. Yeah, like going backwards and uh, forwards, like what did you see in the past and now does it match with like a concentration game? Is Correct. that what you're thinking? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but um, this is a new way of looking at memory because sometimes we have these high aspirations that, oh, if I have just a perfect combination of a poster or a flyer and it has a beautiful image and some really intriguing text, that is why when, one way and you can be memorable and in some circumstances that works because if it's strong enough, it will stay in our memory uh, long term. But an easier way, and we always look for easy ways for the brain to act in your favor, an easier way is to cue them in their environments. So, for example, let's just say that uh, you want to invite people to uh, attend your, um, uh, your dancing classes. And you're thinking, what is something that they will see back in their own context later on that can trigger that memory of, I want to join this program? Is there something that they will see in school? Is there something that um, they're, they're using and maybe they might be seeing on their phone? Is there something that they're using on their backpack? Is there something that in their own environment we can do there to trigger the memory of you? Huh. That's, so folks, you know, this is, this is your homework time. You know, what, what would work for you in this circumstance? You know, that's, I, I think where you're leading these, these cues are, you know, this has been a missing piece. This is really yep. a missing, missing piece. piece. And um, I'll, uh, I'll give you an example that has worked for me. I thought was just so, so appropriate. This uh, person was talking about a motivational uh, mantra that we shall have, which is uh, taking the stairs. It's a metaphor for reminding us to, to work harder in what we do. And um, I thought it was just such an appropriate metaphor because when he's explaining this to us at point A and he says, take the stairs, stairs are such an element that we meet in our contextual lives later on at point B almost all the time. You see stairs in your environment all the time, and that acts as a trigger for his message. So as Jason is saying, as you investigate your own content in your own business, ask for your own audience's case, what is something that they will see later on at point B in their own environment, and you can embed there, which can then trigger a memory for something you consider important. I love this. This makes so much sense. It's, it's, it's amazing. I don't know why this isn't covered, although I guess it, it's now being covered. So that's, that's super important. Um, I, I have a question for you. So... One of the things I always like to ask authors is, you know, what made you write your book? But quite often, the source of a book comes from frustration. And um, because I, I want to study so much more about memory and I want to research it from the angle of how do we stay on other people's memory? 
I noticed how much people forget. For example, I did a study where I was very curious to know how much would people remember after they viewed a PowerPoint deck of 20 slides. And uh, most memory uh, studies that we do happen after 48 hours because memory has to have some consolidation time. And after two days, people remember on average four slides out of those 20. That's not what surprised me. What surprised me was the fact that um, they remembered very little but at random. And that's a danger for all of us in, uh, in, in business. And not only do people retain very little from what we share with them, but what they remember is at random. So responsibility that we all have, and which was one of the reasons I wrote the book, a responsibility we all have is to be in charge of a message people remember. So adding to your, your homework as you reflect on your own content and how you want to approach your customers, know that people will remember things for many reasons. They remember that which is relevant. They will remember that which is shocking. They will remember that which somehow attracted their attention a little bit more. But of all of this, can you still be in charge of one message and one message only that is associated with you? I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have, and that's one of the main reasons I wrote the book. That, that totally makes sense. I, I feel like so many owners out there, um, so many business owners across the world, I, I really are so scattered in the message mm -hmm. they send out. So yeah. I think it's probably challenging for them to be in charge of that one primary message. Oh, so true. I was just um, analyzing somebody's presentation the other day, and I'm looking just no further than the title slide. And on the title slide, he already has three messages. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so which is going to be the uh, – how can you stay congruent to one thought process? Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. So one soul searching from a business perspective that we must always, always go through – is to step back and, and think, what am I about? And in whatever I do, am I about that one thing and one thing only? And can I, can I then leave that on people's mind in a way that I'm in control and it's not left to chance? Oh, that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. All right. It is time for our resource of the week. So, uh, Carmen, let me ask you this. How can my listeners find out more about you and how you're basically helping to uh, change the world one, one memory at a time? <laughs> oh, I, I like that uh, that slogan. <laughs> I, uh, it's yours. <laughs> our business uh, website is uh, memzy.com, which is M-E-M-Z-Y.com. Uh, my uh, email address is csimon at memzy.com. So please stay in touch. I'd love to hear what variables or in what ways you are successful in staying on people's minds. I love this. This is fabulous. All right. I always like to end my podcast, Carmen, with one I, what I consider to be a telling question. So if you could give business owners just one solid piece of advice to either, you know, help their business or more importantly to help them live a better life, what would that piece of advice be? Ooh, for, uh, for a better life in, um, in general, let's, uh, let's intersect that with um, what I send my energy, which is uh, memory. The advice I would have is this, find ways in which you can be memorable because you will literally live longer. We all want to live longer. At least we hope we do. Yeah, because think about it this way. To the extent that when people remember you, you will ex essentially prolonging your, your lifespan. Hmm. Oh, so that's, that, that's fabulous. So you're, you're truly creating that legacy, right? Exactly. There. Exactly. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Carmen, thank you so much for joining me today. I know how busy your schedule is, and I really appreciate you spending some of your time and sharing some of your wisdom with us. This has been brilliant. Thank you so much for, for having me, and um, I wish uh, everyone a, a long and memorable journey. Love that. Folks, that's all the time we've got today. Thanks so much for tuning in to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. For more info about private coaching or to see if you'd benefit from one of my mastermind groups, visit me over at www.jasonmsilverman.com. I look forward to helping you achieve the success that you truly deserve. Until next time, let me leave you with this. Get out there and be the real deal. Set a goal, make a plan, work like hell towards it, and achieve the success that you truly deserve. Now's the time. Get out there and make it happen. This has been Jason Silverman, and I hope you have a spectacular week. You've been listening to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. To access the great resources mentioned in the show and for information on coaching and mastermind group opportunities with Jason, please visit jasonmsilverman.com.